We've been looking in the book of Ephesians, uh, and we've been looking at uh, uh, the first half of the book was all theological. Second half is very, very practical. <clears throat> and as we approach this practical section of the book, I don't know if you uh, were, as a kid, said this. I cross my heart and hope to die. You know the rest? Stick a needle in my eye. Right, okay, you, you got the idea. <clears throat> when we said that, that meant that is for real and for honest and for truth, right? That's it. <clears throat> but how many times have we said that? I cross my heart that this time I'm, my diet's going to work. <laughs> That's why I got it crossed off up there. You see it? I cross my heart. 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 I want to talk about making change stick in our lives. That's what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to make something, some change in my life stick. We know that, like, I've tried this a gazillion times and it just doesn't seem to work. You ever been there? If you've been there, ever at all in your life, this message is for you, so pay attention today. <laughs> all right. The first thing you've got to do, if you want to make change stick in your life, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to identify what needs change changing. This sometimes is the hardest step. We don't want to admit that we got a problem. You know, I'll deny it. We're all going to deny it. No, I don't have a problem. No, I can control my appetite. I know how to shove food away from me as I continue to expand in the middle. Right? Identifying what needs changing? So watch what it says. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live like the Gentiles do. Oh, you know what he's saying here? The change that I want you to make, I want you to do something different. I don't want you to act like your culture. Don't act like you've always acted. Most people, when they try to change, they just try to do harder what they did before that didn't work. Now, where's the logic in that? For years, I, I, I worked in uh, ministering in uh, divorce recovery, and I'd watch people come in, come back in a second time, a third time. I said, you know what? All you're doing is just you're doing harder what didn't work before. You need to stop what you're doing and start doing differently. Do it right. He says, no longer live as the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are, are the people of the world. Okay? People of the world. Don't live like the world. He says, they live in the futility of their thinking. You know, before I got here, I got this guy. He's got his heads wide open, and there's nothing inside. That's what the Bible calls the thinking of people who don't know Jesus. They are empty airheads. I guess that's kind of blunt. When it comes to really spirituality, they know nothing. They just don't get it. They're empty. They're futile, a zero in their thought process. It goes on a little bit for there. It says, they are darkened in their understanding. When it comes to understanding spiritual realities, how to change, they just don't get it. They're like a blind man. They're walking around in the dark and they can't figure out why they can't figure things out in life. They can be extremely intelligent and be spiritually stupid in their understanding. They're blind. They can't see. And separated from the life of God. Listen, the Gentiles that don't know Christ, people who don't know Jesus, they're on one side of this chasm, and God is on the other side. And the two don't meet. He's saying, this is, this is what you don't do. Don't do the, life, the godless thing that you've been doing in the past. You've got to identify what you've been doing is of the world and not of yourself, separated from God, on your own, and you've got to identify it. I've been doing my own thing, and what a mess I've made of my life. <laughs> Notice what it says. Because of the ignorance that is in them. Spiritually, a dunce. Sitting in the corner. They don't get it. In fact, they mock us. We who know Jesus and we live for Jesus, they mock us, they ridicule us. Because they don't get it. 
because of the ignorance that is in them. Wow. He says that ignorance is due to the fact of the hardening of their heart. They have a stone heart. When Cupid's arrow is set, boom, it's broken. There's no sensitivity. It says, having lost all sensitivity, they're heartless, they're cold, they don't care. He goes on and says, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. They're never satisfied. That's the way your life was. That's where your life is without Christ. And he says, while well, a continual lust for more, continual, continual, it's continually it's habitually indulging in things that don't satisfy, and they think, if I just indulge in more, it'll just make me happier. Did you ever notice that? Wealthy people, they're just getting more and more stuff, more and more money, and they don't increase their happiness level. Why? Because they're continually, habitually indulging in more, and in the beginning it didn't satisfy, and it still doesn't satisfy. Are you seeing this? I want to tell you something. Habits are extremely hard to break. That's why change is so difficult. We get ourselves in a habit. I want to talk about habits for a moment. <clears throat> when I was a young boy, maybe about 10 to 12, 13, 14, long there, my parents bought a pool table, and it looked something like this. All right? And my brother and I, we weren't very good at pool. I don't know. I'm still not very good. And I like the game, I'm just not very good at it. And so what we would do in order to assist our ball to make it to the pocket, we'd take our stick, and then we would rub it on the felt pad, back and forth, back and forth, until it kind of made a little trench. That way all you have to do is hit your ball towards the pocket. Oh! There you go, right in. It fell right into the rut. That's exactly what a habit is. I do this thing over and over and over, and I make a rut in my life. And when a temptation comes along, I just swerve right into that rut. Down, down I go, down I go, right down that path. And I, okay, I'm walking along. Oh, there's that temptation. I'm right back, stuck in the pocket of that, that particular sin. I have this habit in my life that it's out there. Anytime I come across that man, I hit that rut, boom, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. I just can't, I can't escape it. A friend of mine, when I was a teenager, had a 1962 Ford Galaxy. It was a beauty. It was just like this one. Only it wasn't yellow, it was white. It was a convertible. And we, I don't know where we learned this, but we learned this, that the, the distance between the tires was exactly the same distance as railroad tracks. So creative young men, you know what we did. We pulled up to the intersection with the railroad crack, tracks and we turned our car back and forth, back and forth till it was sideways and we had it on the rails. And then we took off. We're driving along and you know what? You could take your hand off the steering wheel, put it behind your head. Wherever the track went, the steering wheel would mysteriously move too. And if it, if it went to the right, wheel would turn. If it went to the left, it would go the other way. And it would ride on those tracks. Why? Here's why. You see, the tire on a normal pavement, the surface is flat. But when you put those tires on the railroad tracks, it makes an indentation into the tire. And so there's a rut in the tire. And so wherever that, that, those, those tracks went, that's where the car went. You see, that, that's what happens. When I got a habit in my life, a habit? I'm like driving that 62 Ford Galaxy on the railroad tracks. You see, a habit, there's two kinds of ruts. Those that are in the road and those that are inside of you, like the tire. You've got a rut in your own life. It's called an evil impulse, according to James. Something comes along and I have this evil impulse and I just want to do that. i got to do that. Some people have that evil impulse on desserts. I gotta have it! 
Some on alcohol. I got to have another drink. Some it's smoking. Some, you, I, you know what it is? I everyone has that. You know that because we are practiced sinners. We're good at it. We're good at it. And habits are hard to break. So how do you get out of the rut? How do you get out of the rut in the road? How do you get out of the rut in your, in your life? How do you get out of the rut? Here's the answer. You must know Jesus. That's why the Gentiles, they can't change. They, they, they live and they do evil and down through the ages, people who don't know Jesus, they always do evil, constantly doing evil, constantly doing evil. Why? They don't know Jesus. Watch what it says. However, you did not come to know Christ that way. You, you, you didn't come to know Christ. When you came to know Christ as your Savior, the old was gone, the new had come. That's what the Bible says. If anyone's in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. You have a whole new life. Listen, he says, surely you have, surely you heard of him. You heard about Jesus. You were taught in him. Not only did you hear the message, you began, you were instructed in him with accordance, in accordance with the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to live, you have to have Jesus. You want an abundant, fulfilling life, you have to have Jesus. It says, in the truth. You want to know what is true and real? You have to know Jesus. You want to be on the right path and not stuck in a rut? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the path. You're on the wrong road. Get on the right road. He said, listen, you've got to know Jesus if you really want to have life change that really sticks. I know somebody's saying, in your head, you're thinking this. I know Christ. And I am still struggling with this whole life change. There is this thing in my life I just can't get over. It. I just can't. I mean, I, I tried. I tried to stop this a thousand times, and I just, it just keeps popping its ugly head up. Help me. Help me. Well, at this point, I want to tell you, you don't just change. The Bible says you have to exchange. You don't just change. You have to exchange. What do you mean? you got to stop what you're doing. If a guy is a pickpocket, and so suppose he comes to church, and uh, he's sitting here, and uh, he's not picking your pocket at the moment. Is he still a pickpocket? Yep. He's just not practicing at the moment. If a person constantly lies, and they tell you one truth, are they still a liar? Well, yeah, because they most of the time tell you lies. You see what I'm saying? You've got to stop. It's not enough just to stop something. There's a little riddle that goes like this. When is a door not a door? When it's a jar. <laughs> <All right. laughs> There's a point there. A door is not a door when it becomes something else. And that's what the text saying. It's not just stopping. People try to stop all the time but it is also starting, starting. That's what the passage is going to just go over and over and over again. Watch what it is. You are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off. Put off. Stop your old self. Don't live like you used to. Stop that. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desire. Stop that. Stop that. Then he says, Start. And to put on the new self created to be like God in, right, in true righteousness and holiness. So it's not enough just to stop something, okay? On this side. It's not enough just to stop something, but then you've got to begin, you've got to start something. You've got to start something to exchange what you used to do with something new. That's why the person over here says, oh, I'm just going to try the same diet, only I'm going to try it harder this time. Well, it didn't work the last ten times. Why do you think it's going to work this time? You've got to exchange the failure with the success. You've got to find the success. Now, the passage here is using a metaphor of taking your clothes off and putting clothes on. And I actually thought about putting a nice screen up here, you know, <laughs> being on this side, you know, an old raggedy beat up clothes, you know, I don't know, something from the past. And then I thought about, well, what I would do is go behind the screen, quick, whip all those things off, 
All right, get rid of the old stuff. The reason I didn't do it this way, I was afraid the screen might fall over. <laughs> and I had that embarrassing moment. So, but, so, but the whole idea is here. You put off the old life. You say, listen, I'm dead to that. I died with Christ. That's not me. I'm alive in Jesus. And I put on the new life. <laughs> Everything that I have in Christ Jesus. You see, that, the Bible is saying, listen, it's not enough to just stop doing things. Say, oh, I quit. You've got to replace it. You exchange the old life with a new life. That's how you make change stick. Because if you just stop, you will start that up again. But if you take and replace it, and you replace it for 50 days, you have a new habit. A new habit. See, I'm going to give up my smoking. And I'm going to carry a Bible with me. And every time I have that urge, I'm going to pull out the passage and read this passage where it says, put off, put that off, and put on the new. And I'm going to then read some scripture to replace, replace that. You do that for 50 days, you'll have a whole new habit. A whole new habit. You could do the same with the diet. You could, do, you could do it with a number of things. In fact, he's going to enumerate in this passage some things you can do that. But before he does that, between these two verses where he says, you put off the old, you put on the new, and he actually tells you how to do that. He says right in the middle, the key is to be made new in the attitude of your mind. It's about your head. It's about your head. You know why it's about your head? You need a new attitude you need to view the old as that is what God does not like nor desire. There is a new that God likes and loves and desires. And my heart's desire is I want to please Jesus. And when I get that new attitude, that attitude is everything. Why? And so in Proverbs 23, 7, in the King James Version, it goes like this. For as he thinks in his heart... So is he. What you think. If you think about all this junk, crud in your life, that's what you become. If you think the Word of God, Scriptures, pleasing God, guess what? Over time, this is what you become. Now, will you once in a while stumble back over here? Yeah, because the old habits, sometimes the, the ruts are deep and you get stuck in it again. What do you do? You just, hey, I've got I to gotta get back on, on track. But you make this your habit. You get over here. This is your new habit. Your new habit. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, it tells us that we need to renew our minds. We make our minds new. You read the Word and you get the Word in your mind. That's why you want to memorize some Bible verses. Memorizing Bible verses is whenever I say, nope, I want to stop doing that. And then I quote my, my, my verse. In fact, he says this, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. A stronghold is a really deep rut that's really got a grip on us. It's like a, in a war, getting, you're going up against a fortress. There's this fortress, and you say, how can I beat it? Man, all I got is a pea shooter to shoot against that thing. And, and this fortress, this stronghold, he says, but no, no, we demolish their arguments, their pretensions. They got these arguments. Oh, you can't do it. You can't change. And you say, yes, I can. God said I can change. You tear down all that junk. And then it sets itself up against the knowledge of God because God is a God who changes people who surrender their hearts to him. We take captive every thought. Here we are, back to my mind. I have to tell myself not to think about that stuff and replace it with thinking about something better and new. The exchange life. He begins to enumerate it in our text. <laughs> Listen to what he says. Therefore, each one must put off falsehood. You know what falsehood is? Lying, deceit, deceiving. And you must start speaking truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. 
The word speaking is actually added because that's the way we talk about truth in English. Literally, it's just truthing. Start truthing. Instead of falsehood, start truthing. Start truthing. A lady in our church uh, on the other side of the state put an interesting Facebook post about her coming home from work and finding the dog with what appeared to be a dead rabbit next to it, but she knew it was no blood, just dirty, and knew some animals play dead. And so she went over and she cleaned the whole thing up, realizing this rabbit is my next door neighbor's prize rabbit that she raises. So she cleaned it up and she is going to go over to the neighbor's house and neighbor's not there, open the cage, put it back in, close it. She makes her way back. Neighbor arrives. The neighbor starts, all of a sudden, she, you know, she's kind of listening. All of a sudden there's a shriek. Ah! So she goes running over and says, oh, what's wrong, what's wrong? She said, oh my goodness. She said, I can't believe this. My rabbit died three days ago and now it's back in the cage. <laughs> Obviously, the dog had dug it up. <laughs> she cleaned it up. <laughs> she was trying to cover up. She's trying to deceive the neighbor that maybe her dog didn't do it. It just died. Well, her dog didn't do it. <laughs> and it, it did die. <laughs> you see, we, we play that game of deception, falsehood. Not living. That's see here. In, in the Greek thought here, it's truthing. Everything is true, true about me. What you see on Sunday is what you get on Monday. Is it? Is it the same on Tuesday? The nice, nice and wonderful smiles and the cordial welcomes. Am I like that with my neighbor? or the person who holds a different political position that I do. <laughs> hmm. Truthing. He says, listen, stop your lying, pretending falsehoods and start truthing. See, you exchange one for the other. It's not enough just to stop, you gotta start. He says, stop stuffing. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Okay, I'm going to take the sun down. All right. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You know what he's saying is? Some of us stew. Something's bothering us, and we just stuff it inside. We stuff it and stuff it. And we're like a pressure cooker. And that pressure cooker, that stewing, it builds, the pressure builds, it builds, it builds. And then one day we just explode because the pressure's gotten so great and we, we vent on people. He says, don't do that. Don't do that. Do not, he says, do not give the devil an opportunity. See, he's the one, he's going to put more fire under the flame to make you stew and pressure build till you blow up. Stop. He says, instead... Be angry. Did you know the Bible wants you to be angry? So it says, it's a command. Be angry. What he's saying here is, don't stew, don't let your anger, something that's bothering you today, to spill over to the next day. If it's bothering you today, you deal with it today. And you get angry. You know Jesus got angry? The Bible tells us that he, the zeal of the Lord had eaten him up when they made the temple, a place of merchandise. He made the whip. He was beating the animals, driving them out, overthrowing the money changers' tables. Jesus was angry. There's one place where it says, Jesus gave them an angry look. My son knows what the angry look is. It's when he was misbehaving in church, and I'm up front, and he's sitting there, and I give him the angry look like, you are dead as soon as this service is over. <laughs> Jesus gave an angry look. Are you, you real? Jesus is sinless. You see, my emotions are not evil. My emotions are good. All of them. Do you know the Bible says that we are to hate, hate evil deeds? We're to hate them. Hate is a God-given emotion. 
Anger is a God-given emotion. I need to be angry at the right things and not angry at the wrong things. Most of the time, we're angry at the wrong things. We get angry and we blow up on people. God wants us to be angry and use that energy to solve the problem. If I solve the problem, I won't blow up on the person and God gave me this extra surge of adrenaline rush so that I can fix it, not destroy it. And so he says, hey, stop, stop. With all the anger, stuffing it down inside, start releasing it properly. Properly release it. He says here, he who has been stealing must steal no longer. He's got to stop stealing. What's it say over here? But instead, he must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. You know why God gave you a job? So that you could make enough to help someone else. I think you'd probably get a bigger raise or he'd stretch your dollars more if you shared more of them with someone else. When it says stop stealing, do you remember that passage in Malachi where the Bible says to the priests that they have robbed God? Whoa. And they said, well, how have we robbed you? He said in your tithes and offerings. You have not tithed. You've robbed me. Now listen, if I'm going to rob anybody, he's the last one I want to rob. You agree? I think you agree. He's the last one. He says, listen, if you just honor me with your tithe, don't give me everything, just a tenth. Give me a tenth. And you start doing that. You start doing that. I started practicing this as an 11-year-old boy, giving God a tenth. I made $10 a week on my paper out, and I gave him a dollar in the church envelope every week. It probably cost them more to record my dollar a week. <laughs> then, then, but it, it started the habit. You see, I exchanged selfishness over here that it's all about me and i got to have all my stuff. I like, God, I, I can give you one-tenth. The text says, if you will do that, he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great you cannot contain it. My wife and I often say, we can't believe how God has blessed us so much. Isn't that right? I one time had a financial uh, advisor say to me, he said, man, I wish I could tell everybody what you're doing. <laughs> I said, what am I doing? He said, well, you're giving God 10%, and you've got more than most people who don't give him anything. God does so much with your money. How do you do this? It's just mind-blowing. Why? It's the Word of God. When you exchange, you stop doing the things that are wrong and you start doing the things that are right, God blesses your life. That blessing becomes the motivation then for doing other things right. It's just, it's cyclical. You learn that you can change. You know, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yes, you can if you're the old dog. God is in that business. That's what this passage is all about. Listen. He said, do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. I don't mean to do an advertisement, but even when it comes to television, movies, we do not like to watch the ones where there's foul language in it. So there's this app you can get. It's called VidAngel, and you can tell it to take out like 120 different curse kind of words. And you take them all out. You run the movie through it. Now the movie, every time you would be talking along, and then, and then it'd be talking along. It takes the words right out. You could tell, take out a lot of other things, violence, sex, all of that. You take whatever you want. Somebody said to me, well, when you're all done taking everything out, how long is the movie? Well, a three-hour movie is about 10 minutes. <laughs> you got the idea. We live in a culture that is totally saturated living like Gentiles do. But that's not why he saved us to live like that. He made us holy and blameless. We're to be different, a peculiar people. A people when somebody meets me and says, he's a Christian. Why? I can tell by the way he talks. I can tell by the way he thinks. I can tell by the way he spends his money. I can tell by, and he just go down the list. And I've never even 
told them about Jesus yet. And they said, but he's a Christian. Why? Because we live so differently. He says, stop. And this is what he says you should do instead. He said, start. But only what is helpful for building up other people. We call that praise. When, 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 it's simply, it's bragging. When I brag about somebody else, okay, that's, that's praise. When I brag about God, that's praise. But when I brag about myself, I'm boasting. I'm boasting. Instead of using bad language, he says, make sure what you say builds the other person up. What if it's a guy who doesn't even like me and he's cursing me out? You know, he says, God, damn you and all this. I said, man, I didn't know you were a praying man. You just invoke God to do something for me. You must be, pray- you must be a man of prayer. You know what? He'll probably be agitated all the more. You might not want to try that one. Um, but you get my picture? I do not have to talk like the Gentiles talk. I don't. I can talk like Jesus talked and follow in his steps. He says, stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Oh, do you realize? The Holy Spirit is a person. He indwells me. We've already covered that. He indwells me. And the Holy Spirit is a person. And when I live like the Gentiles, he is grieved. Do you ever have a child do something that really broke your heart? And you grieve. You grieve over your child's life. I am a child of God. When I am stuck in the muck and the mire, I'm in the old rut of the Gentile. God, the Holy Spirit's heart, grieves for me. Oh, that you would just get your act together. You've said that. I know you've said that. I know you've said that. Instead, he says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen. The moment I accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit invaded me. He is the seal, who is the mark of ownership, that I belong to God. I belong to God. What he's saying here is, stop looking like the world. Look like the child of God. Start looking like a Christian. Start acting like a Christian. And he says, stop all your hostility. You know, it's hard. You're driving down the road and the guy cuts you off and man, you want to speed up in front of him, cut him off too. Or am I the only one like that? Yep, I can tell. I'm the only one like that. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, road rage, and anger, brawling, slander, saying bad things about people. We sometimes do it in a prayer request. Oh, have you heard about so-and-so? We really need to pray for so-and-so because then you know, we give the laundry list. Yeah. Get rid of all the bitterness, the rage, the anger, the brawling, the slander, along with every form of malice. All your hostility. Watch what he says. Instead, be kind. Kind. You know, you can kill your enemy with kindness. Just kill them with kindness. You just be kind back to them. Compassionate. Be kind and compassionate to one another. And here's the word. Here's how you do it. Forgiving. See the guy hanging under the rope? Forgiving simply means you let go. Did you you catch that? It means let go. Problem is we let go and then we pick it back up again. Oh, I forgive you. And then all of a sudden something's wrong and then it brought all back up again. Disciples asked Jesus about this thing of forgiveness and said, uh, hey, you know, if I uh, forgive, uh, how, how often should I forgive my, my brother? If he sins against me, somebody, somebody does something that really irks me and I'm ticked off about it and angry, how many times should I forgive that person? Seven times? And then Jesus says, 70 times, seven times. What? When he said seven times, he thought, well, that's a high number. If I forgive a guy seven times, man, I've really gone the distance. And then Jesus says seven times, 70 times. And the implication is seven times, 70 times for the same thing on the same day. Who can do that? God expects that of us. Be kind, 
compassionate, forgiving. How? Just as Christ forgave you. Here's a few thoughts I want you to take home with you. Number one, you've got to identify what you need to change. Secondly, you really have to know Christ. Not just about him, you've got to know him as your Savior. Make him your Lord. You don't just change, you've got to exchange. You've got to replace a bad habit with a good habit. You do so in practical ways of putting off the old habit and putting on a new habit. And it all comes down to renewing your mind, changing your attitude, changing your attitude. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that this is the process of sanctification. You have set us apart to be different from all the world. Our part is now that we are set apart to live like it. And Lord, it's a struggle because we do have habits in our lives. Help us, Lord, to replace those bad habits with new habits that are righteous, holy, good, loving, compassionate, forgiving, kind. All these wonderful traits. We know that with your help, because if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. With your help, we can change and make it stick. Help us do that in our lives. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.